Welcome. My name is Gail Huntress, and I'm from the Shootsbury Broadband Committee, and I'm also part of the Wired West Outreach Committee. Shootsbury is one of the current 27 towns that are part of the Wired West Cooperative, and we have been working for almost a decade to find a solution to bring broadband to our community. It is great to be speaking to a packed room today, and I'd like to give a special welcome to our distinguished guests. Bill Ennin, Last Mile Liaison from the Governor's Office, Senator Adam Hines, and Mary Jane Bacon from Senator Rosenberg's office. I'd also like to welcome representatives from all of the towns, both current Wired West members and our guest towns that chose to join us today. We have people representing a good portion of the underserved towns throughout Massachusetts here. Uh, these towns include Ashfield, Beckett, Blanford, Chesterfield, Cummington, Goshen, Heath, Leiden, Middlefield, Mount Washington, New Ashford, New Salem, Peru, Petersham, Plainfield, Shutesbury, Washington, Wendell, and Worthington. Welcome. So I'm going to be giving the presentation today, but we also have a panel of experts from the Wired West Executive Board here to answer questions. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Um, Jim? Uh, Jim Draw, I'm Chairman of Wired West. I'm from Cummington. Charlie Rose from Worthington. I'm Bob Labrie from Goshen. And Leslie. I'm Leslie Rule from Plainfield. Um, I will be personing the parking lot, and Gail will explain what that's going to be. Mm -hmm. But also, if you need any help or information, come to me. Leslie is responsible for all of the uh, coffee, snacks, and wonderful hospitality this morning. So I have three goals today. I want all of you to leave with an understanding of the Wired West plan and have an understanding of your costs and responsibilities for your particular town. I also want you to have all the information you need to make an informed decision with your town leadership. To that end, we have, this, we have a little thumb drive, one for each town, that we will have all the materials on it that we're discussing today. So you can take that back with you and share the files with all of your town leadership. We have one for each town, and uh, so we'll make sure that every town gets one. The files will also be posted on our website if for some reason you can't get in touch with whoever took your drive. <laughs> this is our... This is our cooperative, and we're all members, so we want to be as open and transparent as possible with the information, which is why we're giving it to you. In addition, the executive and outreach committees are here to support you. So after the meeting today, if you have more questions or need a presentation done in your town, or your finance committee needs to sit down with us and go over numbers detail by detail, that can happen, and we're glad to do it. So for today, this is going to be part presentation and part workshop. It is designed for town leaders, so if you're a member of the general public who came today, welcome. And uh, we hope it's not too dense. We will be going over a very brief history of what got us here today. We'll go over the plan in detail. We'll have a breakout session in the middle. And we will end with an extensive question and answer session. By a show of hands, how many people here are frustrated with the last mile build process so far? <laughs> okay. Now, keep your, keep, your, keep your hands raised, and if you would like the governor to know how frustrated you are, if you would please stand. <laughs> and keep your hands raised, way up high. Charlie is taking a picture of this. We are sending it to the governor. Bill, uh, Bill Ennin, wherever you are, I hope you noted that. <laughs> all right. Thank you for that. So I want to acknowledge that we are all on the same page here, and I am going to ask you to put that frustration aside for the next couple of hours. This morning is about finding a solution to the challenge of operating a sustainable network, and I want to stay focused on that. Our hope is that there might be just a little less frustration when we're done, and we hope that you leave 
uh, seeing that Wired West is bringing a solution to part of the problem. So how we got here. Wired West started workings in 2009 to solve the rural broadband crisis. Uh, they were instrumental in statewide education and outreach in getting the $50 million last mile grant. Throughout 2014 and 2015, this outreach continued with the cooperation of the Massachusetts Broadband Institute. And by the spring of 2015, towns are voting in record-breaking turnouts to raise tax bonds to pay for broadband. That's a little picture of my packed school gym in Shutesbury. By summer 2015, things changed. The state revised its policy and required all towns to own their own infrastructure. This made Wired West's original plan of a cooperatively owned and operated network impossible. Towns are required to own all the infrastructure within their borders if they want to use state money. Shortly after, the state policy re was revised again to encourage private ownership. And this was manifested in the recent RFP process by the Massachusetts Broadband Institute. So now, towns have basically two options. Invest your tax dollars and build and own your entire network, or give your share of your build grant and sometimes even more to a private company to build, own, and operate your network, if that is indeed an option available to you. So I want to be clear that the Wired West solution we'll be talking about is directed only at those towns who want to invest in their own network. You want to build, own, and operate it. Later on in the Q&A session, we can talk more about the recent RFP response released by the MBI, but for now we're focused on just solving the problem for towns that want to own their own network. So let's say you're one of these towns and you uh, want to bring broadband to your community and you want to use your tax dollars to do it and you want to invest in critical <coughs> infrastructure. For today's discussion, it's helpful to think of your town project in these two separate parts, the build and the operations. Now, the build part is still a complex issue that will need to be handled by each town and the Massachusetts Broadband Institute. It will be paid for solely by your town and by the MBI grants. It includes everything related to getting your network in place, from the poll survey to the poll applications, to make ready and to the actual construction and installing fiber from the curb to the home. So I know that many of you likely came today wanting a, a quick answer to the question, well, when's, when's this going to happen? And I want to be clear that's outside the scope of today's meeting because we are focused on the second part, the operations. Because once you get that network built, then what? Well, you need to find a way to run and maintain it. And that's what the operations is. The money you take in from your subscribers paying for their broadband service has to cover all of your annual costs to run it. Plus, you need to cover your network depreci depreciation reserve and your debt service. By debt service, I mean the money you borrowed to build your network in the first place. You'll notice those last two items are highlighted in red because I want you to bookmark those things in your mind. We're going to be talking about them in depth later. Um, I do realize that the build part is a huge challenge. I don't mean to minimize it or, or discount it. It's, it's, it. It is the thing to make this work. But again, it's outside the focus of what we're talking about today. Wired West continues to be a source of information and advocacy, trying to help that build part move forward. But per state policy, the final deal for that has to be between your individual town and the state. Moving the builds forward is up to the MBI. But having a solution to the operations half of the problem will help many towns answer the question of how to run their municipal network once it's going. We're focused on solving this part. So why is this a big deal? Why does it matter to have a solution for operations? And I want you to think about uh, how your town runs right now. In my town, we have many of our committee seats unfilled. 
We're working on a shoestring budget with limited paid personnel and not enough volunteers to do the rest of the work. <coughs> town announcements regularly go out on our town listservs, begging for people to join and serve in town government. I am so proud of the work that we do on our limited resource. All of us who do work on behalf of the town then are looking at taking on this additional major project. And with limited resources, how are we going to operate our municipal broadband network in a sustainable way? Let's think some more about what it takes for a town to operate their own network. Here's a partial list on the screen. Manage poll licenses and bonding fees for those polls. Pay annual rental fees to the utilities. Bill subscribers. Manage contracts with your internet service provider and maintenance providers. Negotiate new contracts and RFP for qualified vendors every three to five years as those original contracts expire. Pay your middle mile connection, no small thing. Oh, and you still have to insure everything and manage your rates and deductibles. Is your head spinning yet? We feel a bit overwhelmed. Well, the Wired West solution aims to solve all of this. By banding together in a regional way, all of this can be handled. And even better, it's cost effective and it will save your town and your subscribers money. So how does this work? Well, as few as five towns or these 27 towns will band together. <coughs> Each town will build their own network and it will be connected together at town borders to form a ring structure and here's a scheme of what that could look like. Now, there's two big advantages to doing a regional connected build like this. One is middle mile connection fee savings. It will cost each and every town over $28,000 per year to pay for backhaul. For those that don't know, backhaul just means your local connection to the backbone internet. It's how your information gets out and in from your local community to the, to the world wide web. So, this connection is costly, and so alone by doing a regional network, each town automatically saves over $28,000 a year. Next is redundancy. A uh, regional network is more stable, so instead of having just one way to get the internet to you, you have dozens. In case of breakages, there's a better chance your service will remain un uninterrupted because the service can be rerouted in, in dozens or sometimes hundreds of different ways. So with this regional design, you may be wondering who owns what, if you're all connected. But ownership is very simple. You own what you've paid for. So that means your town owns everything within its town borders, except for some routers and minor electronics located <coughs> near town's hut. Um, I was using this term earlier and some people were wondering what a hut was. I think they're envisioning like a little mud thing with straw. No, this is a little tiny building where your electronics to run your network are housed. Most, in most cases, it's located in a central location like at your fire station or at your town hall. So that's what I mean when I say hut. So again, an easy way to understand this is you pay for it, you own it. One thing I should mention is in regards to the regional design, you may be wondering, well, wait a minute, if all these towns are building out their own network, how on earth do, do, does it work together? And the answer is, is that as long as the networks built in each town meet technical specifications and have connection points at the town borders, it's fine. So those can be provided and the MBI has already said they want to do this and want to see this in every build that they do is uh, the regional construction points. Okay, so how much is this gonna cost? And again, we're just talking about operations here, not the build. So $75 for the standard plan and $59 for the economy plan plus adding phone for $19. Currently, most customers in the Wired West area are served by Verizon, and these rates are very competitive to what customers are paying now for inferior service for DSL and phone. And you also may be wondering where these prices come from. How can we be sure that all of this can be offered at these rates we just discussed, take care of that huge long list of things, and how is that sustainable? 
Well, years of research and thought went into making sure that we can do this and that it's sustainable for the long haul. I don't want you to take my word for it. I'm going to have Jim come up and go over the underlying assumptions of the pricing model so you can see this for yourself. Uh, so we're going to do a little switch here and we're going to pull up the spreadsheets that, that generate and show these numbers. So while we're uh, putting up the slides for this, I want to remind you that you are just getting an overview today. There's a lot of data and you'll see that when we start looking at the spreadsheet. And Jim is just going to touch on the highlights so you understand where the basics come from. Again, we're really glad to sit down with you and go over all the numbers in detail by request. As town leaders, it's your responsibility to understand this. And, and know how it works. We want you to have faith and confidence in the plan, and so offering of all the full information and support is what we want to do. All right, Jim. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Back in uh, November, uh, Wired West put out an RFI to see if there were any companies that were willing to provide uh, regional services for us. Uh, we got three viable companies that gave, uh, gave us responses. Uh, we've been negotiating with them we're now down to two companies uh, to provide internet and phone service and line maintenance and inside plant maintenance and building us a website uh, for taking orders and all of those things that are involved with running an operation. The things that we did not ask the uh, internet service providers to provide were things that involved poles, like pole licenses, pole maintenance, insurance, and pole bonds. Those would be covered by uh, wired West out of the fees that we're charging the customers. So the two companies that have given us responses and their bids are really close for the wholesale prices, uh, Westfield Gas and Electric and OTT Communications out of Maine. OTT Communications is a fairly old company. They've been uh, running uh, uh, phone systems for a long time. They have their own fiber networks. They are providing fiber to the home to, to residences in, in Maine. They're also used to uh, white labeling their services for others to use. When Time Warner went into Maine, OTT was providing phone service for Time Warner for several years until Time Warner bought their own equipment and took it up. So OTT runs Granby Telephone in Massachusetts, so they do have a local presence, and they have recently taken over the Leverett uh, contract for providing services for Leverett Net. So they're one vendor that uh, is uh, fully capable. We've interviewed them. We're on, on track for uh, further negotiations uh, on services and prices uh, to see what makes sense. Westfield Gas and Electric uh, came in with bids that are very, very similar to OTTs. Uh, there's not much difference between the two in terms of price, wholesale price for our services. Uh, uh, they are in Westfield, obviously. They've been running a gas and electric company for 100 years, uh, providing services to the, all of the citizens in Westfield. Uh, so they have extensive uh, experience with bucket trucks and with linemen. Uh, they have their own uh, 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 engineering services in-house. They are in the process of, of rolling out Whip City, uh, which is a fiber to the home network uh, in Westfield. So they have, they have the depth and the breadth of services that we need uh, for running this operation. So we have two very credible uh, companies who are willing to work with us and provide wholesale services to us that will be white labeled as Wired West. So when a customer uh, calls up, the uh, phones will be answered as Wired West phones. The bills will all say Wired West on them. So how did we come to pricing? We know that our main competition in all of these towns is Verizon with their DSL and their phone. I know that I currently pay $93 a month for DSL and phone. I've seen some bills that are $109 for DSL and phone, and I've seen some that are $75. Uh, so it varies from town to town and from person to person. There's no standard Verizon fee. But we felt that being that was our competitor, we needed to offer a product and a service that was price competitive to Verizon because take rate is extremely important to the success of your network. The more people are taking service, the lower the, the, uh, the more the costs are spread out across those people and the more sustainable your network is. So we said, all right, what is the minimum take rate that we can expect in all these towns? 
We went out last year with a, a campaign to get people to sign up and send us a check for $49 so they were, we knew they were serious. Our target at that time was 40%. Uh, we hit that. We have uh, gotten 7,000 customers sign up and send us a check for $49, $40,000, that'd be nice. <laughs> uh, their money is still sitting in an escrow account and waiting for us to light up the system and uh, give them service, and that money will be applied to their, their first month's bill. So uh, what we've got here, did we have a 40% take rate? So I said, all right, let's, let's start at what we know. We know that we can at least get a 40% take rate. Uh, can we be viable at 40%? We don't know how many people will take the $75 product. We don't know how many people will take phone. So what the numbers look like if everybody only took the $59 product at a 40% take rate. So what you're seeing here is the, uh, the average revenue per sub is $59. What we've done is calculated what the minimum number of customers required is in order to cover the operation expenses. Those operating expenses, aside from the wholesale costs uh, that we're getting from the vendors, are all of the uh, poles, pole licenses, general liability insurance for the outside plant, spares, those kinds of things to operate. And what we're seeing is that for some towns like Rowe, they'd need to get 101% take rate. <laughs> for other towns like Schutzberry, they would need to get a 40% take rate. If all of us are working together, we need a 38% take rate overall. So what we what we found for our analysis and our analysis is that if the big towns customers pay one or two dollars more, the little towns customers save a whole lot of money and make this whole thing work. It works as a region. It doesn't work very well as a standalone uh, entity. So at a 38% take rate, uh, at $59, all of our expenses are covered and this is a viable operation. At a 60% take rate, these numbers go down and we're still viable. 60% is reasonable. What we're seeing, what Leverett is seeing is an 80 plus percent take rate. So at a $59, everybody taking the lowest product we show that the, in, the entire network can be viable, can be long-term sustaining. I will, if anybody wants me to come to their town and walk through all the details behind these sheets, I'd be glad to do that, but I don't want to get, I know there are a lot of people that aren't into spreadsheets here, so <laughs> I don't want to spend a lot of time on spreadsheets. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry if you already mentioned this, but what happens if all of those towns on the spreadsheet don't participate? So you have the 38.6% take rate right. overall. That's based on participation of a certain number of towns, question mark. And if all of those don't participate, they go with some other route, mm -hmm. what happens? What happens is that, is that it depends upon which towns participate and which towns don't. We know that uh, you'll see this A and B over here. We've scored the towns based on what we have been working with. And we know which towns are very, very inclined to go with a regional solution, which towns are looking at other alternatives, and which towns are less inclined to go with, with uh, Wired West and a regional solution. So what we're showing here is the A towns, those towns that we've been in communication with that are pretty solid with us. Uh, and that gets us that 38%. If we pull up the B towns, and my town is one of them, uh, there are there is a number of towns in here that are think they want to go with a regional solution, but are looking at other solutions seriously. And then we have the C towns down here uh, who are going off and doing their own thing, uh, but they may come back to us uh, at some point for services. So what we see here is that if we get the A plus B towns, we get a 40% take rate required at 60%. Uh, so the number of towns, these will, numbers will change slightly, but there's some savings by going with a region. The savings are on the backhaul. For the town of Leverett, for instance, they've got two, two gigs to serve that town. Uh, the backhaul on the MBI network is $28,000 a year. 
If we have that ring solution, we know only need one connection to the ring to go back to Springfield so at, at a 10 gig, and that's a lot cheaper than each town going. So there's some savings there uh, on a regional solution and make, makes it more viable. And there's savings in the insurance and some other uh, cost factors here by building a regional network and operating it regionally that make it more viable. If I can chime in here, this can work for as few as five towns. It depends on which towns those are. As long as there are a few big, bigger towns in the mix, it's sustainable. Um, and again, uh, if you are curious about that, I recommend you sit down with a spreadsheet and your town finance in or, and or invite Jim and an executive committee to come and show you how that works so you understand it. But it can work for as little as five towns. Okay. Any other questions? Jim, will you say something about the conservative nature of the modeling here and, and go back to the first tab, if you would, Bob or Gail, and, and talk about why we have the take rates for the upper tiers set at 0% right now? The reason we have the uh, tier two at zero, we have the phone at zero, and we have 100% at the $59 is we want to be extremely conservative. We want to make sure that the product pricing that we're offering we'll pay for the expenses. We don't expect that that will be the reality when we get out there, uh, but we want to make sure that we set a price point that one is competitive with Verizon so that we know that we can get a high take rate, we can get conversion, and two, makes the network sustainable. So that's the reason we set these at zero and zero and 100% with a 40% with a 40% take rate to find out if this thing was going to be viable at these price points. Yes, sir. Uh, Could you come up to the mic, please? Uh, is it, where is the number for uh, Wired West overhead? Wired West overhead. Yeah. <laughs> the majority of the expenses are going to be covered by the service providers. So, Wired West overhead is is pretty close to zero. The only bills that Wired West will be paying out of the uh, fees will be the, the poll licenses for each town and that's an annual bill from Verizon and from your power company uh, and those will go to our accountant the accountant will cut will cut a check uh, the uh, insurance is an annual bill that'll go to the accountant the account will cover check uh, so the operating expenses for Wired West to manage this is that the executive committee will still exist as a group of volunteers will sign the warrants for those uh, and the sign those checks once a year and we'll have uh, interactions with the vendors or with the uh, service providers on an ongoing basis to make sure the quality of service is high. Uh, so I don't see any. There's no administrative costs. You don't have, uh, you do, you've got to pay the accountant, right? Yep, I pay the accountant. That's all we need. And maybe some legal fees for contracts. Okay, curious. Thank you. Uh, you said that the uh, for the network to work, uh, it's clear that the larger towns are, to some extent, subsidizing the smaller towns but the amount of money is uh, relatively small. Uh, but other than out of the goodness of their heart, uh, for those people in those towns for whom a dollar or two may make a difference, uh, is there something you can say about the benefits to the larger towns of being part of this regional network as opposed to them doing it alone? I, yes. I can actually speak to that. So uh, again, my name is Gail, you know me, and I'm from Shutesbury, and we are the most profitable town on this list. Um, my finance committee has run through all of these numbers. We've spoken to independent vendors. And by going with Wired West to be our operator, to, by going with the operator uh, uh, and not doing it on our own, we can get within $3 of, uh, say, the independent plan of if we just did this all on our own. And that does not take into account the fact that we would be using almost no town resources for this because that big list is taken care of. So even though our subscribers would be paying a few dollars extra per month, it's going to save our town a lot of money and resources because we won't be saddled with having to manage our own broadband network on a day-to-day -day basis. And if Jeremy from Beckett could come up and give his answer to that as well. 
Well, I have the same answer. Um, Beckett is not one of the most profitable towns, but it's somewhere in the middle. I think that the the differential between Beckett doing it on its own and Beckett becoming part of the co-op is like a dollar a month. And um, our town administrator, Mr. Gibson, is sitting right here, and he would be the person who would get saddled with all the additional responsibilities of running this network, which I think he's eager to not do. Um, <laughs> I don't want to put words in your mouth, Ed, but... No, I wouldn't, because I just delegated to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah he, would de he would delegate it to me, and I'm a volunteer, and unfortunately, I I'm probably the, the person upon whom it would fall, and I don't have time to do it. It's a lot of work. If you want... There's a wonderful document. If there's anybody here from Levert, we have to thank you very, very much for producing a tremendously helpful a PowerPoint presentation that was done about a year and a half ago, which lists all of the steps and actions that the town of Leverett went through uh, to build and operate their own network. And it's a very daunting list. It's quite long. And there's many, many person years worth of work that went into it. And when you look at that list and you realize what's necessary, you think, why, do, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to reinvent the wheel? Or why would I at least want to do that as my own town when we can get together and do that together? That's, my, that's Beckett's answer. Yes, ma'am. My question is, I looked at Gail's slides with the rings and your slides with the A, B, and C regions. How do those intersect? Because you're talking about rings and redundancy, and then you're talking about different regions according to town. Does it have to be contiguous towns? Good question. Uh, most of the towns are contiguous. Uh, they don't have to be because we can, if we have to, uh, use the MBI to connect between <coughs> rings, or we can uh, lease fiber from them or, or rent it on a, on a, on a uh, monthly basis. My preference would be to lease fiber. The, the advantage of leasing dark fiber is that there's no volume constraint. We can put as much as we want to through that fiber for the same price. The other advantage of using leased fiber is that it's a 20-year lease you pay for it up front. That's the reason I call it an indefeasible right of use, IRU, if you ever see that acronym. What that means is you've already paid for the lease up front so that nobody can break it. And when you do that, that comes out of your capital uh, and it's a one-time cost up front and it's part of your construction cost so that it, it doesn't add to the monthly operating expense. Okay? Any other questions? Yes, sir. If Wired West is not receiving any funds, what's the intrinsic motivation for the volunteers to stay and maintain the organization that's going to be needed? Does that make sense? Yep, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, we've been working for five years to make this thing happen, five plus years. Uh, spend a lot of time on the road and a lot of time in meetings. Uh, the reason that we will continue to do this is because we're users of the network and we want to see it successful. Uh, and all of us that are, that are on this committee, uh, a lot of us uh, have businesses that require the internet, uh, so we want to make it successful. We're all volunteers, some of us are selectmen. Uh, you know, we, we're all involved in town government and, and we do this because it's the right thing to do. Okay. Have you looked at crunching numbers to um, add a fee structure that would uh, funnel some of the monies towards Wires West to bolster. Uh, we we have about, not. We know, have not because I said the the bills that Wired West is going to have to pay are there's four bills. Sure. Uh, the accountant's going to take care of their five bills. There's the, the accountant's going to take care of that. He's going to put them on a warrant. Uh, that warrant is going to go to the executive committee. We sign it. The warrant. Uh, the uh, accountant cuts a check and mails it off once a year. Okay. The the thing about a municipal light plant cooperative is that every town has a seat on the board, okay? And because the cooperative is the one that is managing those contracts for services, that cooperative needs to continue to exist with a representative sitting on that board and being able to make decisions about pricing. What are the prices we're gonna charge? Because if you run these numbers and you get an 80% take rate and you get the 50% uh, uh, of the people taking uh, the, uh, the, the one gig service and 50% and of the people taking telephone, you'll see that these prices could go down by $10, $15, right? Because we, we set the prices at a minimum take rate. We want to make sure this will be successful, but if we, if when we get to operating and we see that the take rates are higher, that the price mix is higher, yeah. then the board could decide, well, we're going to lower the price by 10 bucks or 15 bucks per customer. Okay, so that, that board will always be there on an ongoing basis, and because it's a board of directors, there's always an executive committee gotcha. selected from that. Uh, for each municipal light plant, the board of selectmen has appointed a uh, municipal light plant manager, 
who will always be in place. That manager is one of the directors of, of the Wired West Consortium, or the uh, co-op. Okay. So we will, uh, we will continue to exist. We do it because we are community-oriented people. Okay, thank you, Jim. Appreciate yes, ma'am. I just have a, a quick question related to um, the profit potential. I appreciate you taking a it's, conservative it's, approach on this, but I think it's most people like us would want to have phone, and we might want to go for the higher speed. So um, my question is, you know, if you run it with maybe a 75% take rate and then people having, you know, 50% take phone and 40% take the high-speed Internet, um, and you have profits, um, how would the profits be shared? Okay, good question. Uh, my, my team didn't want me to show what the profits were. <laughs> uh, but I will tell you that if we get a 70, 80% take rate, uh, we get a product mix with uh, half the people taking uh, the $75 uh, service, we will have retained earnings after we pay all the expenses of over a million dollars which is the reason I say that we could, we could lower rates by 10 bucks a, a, a pop. Uh, those, re those excess revenues can be one or two, we can do one or two things with them. We can reduce rates and maintain those fees within Wired, those excesses within Wired West as a cash reserve for unknown circumstances like uh, a lot of cars hitting a lot of trees and causing us a lot of line maintenance expense. Or the board of directors can vote to give that money back to the towns. And the formula that, that we've worked out for giving the money back to the towns after all bills are paid is based on the proportion of money that is earned in each town. Okay, So if your town generated more than, ta than the other town, you'll get a higher percentage back. All right. So that's the formula that we've worked out and, and the board has, has agreed to. Any other questions? Great, thank you. I hope that Jim shed some light on why these rates are set where they are and uh, shown that it's a very sustainable model. Uh, remember that the fees subscribers pay will take care of all of the items on that big list we talked about involved with running a town's network. So. There's two things not on the list that your town is still responsible for. Anybody want to take a guess at what those are? Yes, sir. The cost of the network. Right, the build cost. Thank you. And somebody up here said depreci depreciation reserve. Very good. So remember how I told you to bookmark those and remember them? Now we're going to talk about them. So depre depreciation reserve and debt service. Debt service is, of course, paying back your tax bond for the money you borrowed to build in the first place. And what's a depre depreciation reserve? It's a fixed budget item required by law to replace the infrastructure. It's set at a minimum of 3% of your total build costs. It must be added annually and set aside for eventual replacement of your network. So the fiber itself will, la will last um, somewhere between 20 and uh, 40 years. Uh, the electronics have to be replaced around every seven. So the depre depreciation reserve is set aside to pay for that, and again, it's law. Your town can't say, eh, we're, we're not going to worry about replacing it. You have to do it. So where's the money going to come from? How is your town going to pay for the depre depreciation reserve? And I am making an assumption for the time being that the repayment of your bond for the build is coming out of taxes. Okay, so that's taken care of over here in taxes. But depre depreciation reserve. Um, and the answer is that there's going to be a line item on every subscriber's bill that will be added on as a per town fee. This is a town choice. Notice the breakdown of the cost to subscribers that we just talked about. Up in the top there, the $59.19. Uh, this is the service cost that goes to Wired West to pay for that big list of all the operations. It covers just about everything, except the depreciation reserve. So your town gets to tack this fee onto customers within your town borders, and all that money in that town fee comes back to you. Uh, we're going to have a breakout session in just a few minutes so you can start considering what your town fee will be. 
Uh, you'll also notice that I put debt service here as an optional item. Your town may choose to add all or part of your debt repayment onto your town fee. Most towns uh, will prefer to have their debt service paid out of tax rolls uh, because even if you don't subscribe to broadband, having it in your town benefits everyone. So in most towns, the philosophy is that taxes should pay for it. But I don't want to get in an argument about the schools of thought around this. Uh, your town gets to decide how to handle your depre depreciation reserve and your debt service. But at the very least, your town fee needs to cover the depreciation. So uh, what I'm going to ask you to do in a minute is we're going to take a break and you're going to get together with other members from your town and work on completing the worksheet uh, to start the conversation about your town fee. Now, I realize that not everyone here is a town official, so um, if you are not a town official, feel free to go to your town officials and, and listen in or just take a long break. Um, I see your hand in the back, one moment. The question that was just asked is, is where are you considering the drop fee? And what that means is the, the cost of installation, so running the fiber from the curb to the home. Um, and the answer is that that is all included in your town's build and construction, all right? It is not part of this. Because you as a town decide what kind of network you're going to build and who is going to get service and if there's limits on that. I do have a slide a little bit later and, and I'll explain that a little bit more fully, but uh, that's part of the build costs, not part of this. So if you look at that worksheet, you can see it's a very simple calculation. It's how much money your town needs for depre depreciation reserve divided by the number of subscribers. Then you'll know how much money you need to collect per subscriber per month to pay for that depreciation. Um, so what we're going to ask you to do is figure out two things, a very, con very conservative town fee and an optimistic town fee based on your town's data. So the two spreadsheets you have on one side, it's a 40% take rate, and on the other side, it's 60%. This will give you the very conservative ranges to figure out your town fee. If you overestimate your take rate, your town will have to make up the difference with free cash. So that's why we're recommending that everybody start super conservatively. You may want to discuss including an extra charge to cover all or part of your debt service. Um, I do want to point out that some towns are rolling in the dough. For example, you have a power plant row. Um, <laughs> yeah, you may choose to have no town fee um, and instead pay for that through, pay for the depre de <laughs> depreciation reserve through taxes. So that's an option too. But for today, um, <coughs> make, that, make that town fee be your depreciation. At the end of the day, you do have to cover both. But again, we're assuming that your taxes are covering the build costs and that the town fee is only covering the ongoing depreciation. As you work on this, jot down questions and concerns. If you need help, raise your hand. We'll all be circulating. And we do realize this is a super simplified exercise and it's meant to be simple. We're going for estimates today. Uh, you'll have a full analysis tool and all the back end data on your thumb drive for better accuracy later when you sit down with your finance committees. You have three things to do during this time. So gather and talk to members of your town, come up with a high and low town fee estimate, and take a break.